Hello, are you ready for another disease? Woohoo! I hope you can see this. I, uh, um, oh, let me get this set up. That's not working right. Come here. There we go. All right. So, um, as I promised, another week, another disease. This time we're looking at smallpox. All right. Um, what we're this is probably going to be a longer video because we've got a lot to cover. I'm going to talk about the facts of the disease, um, then the historical impact of smallpox, especially in the Americas. Then I'm going to talk about historical demography. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's going to be great. Methodology and limits of what we can figure out, right? Um, development of vaccination and eventual eradication. Because if you don't know. Um, smallpox is, well, was a, uh, a horrible disease, um, tremendous impact on societies globally, um, I mean, historical impact, <clears throat> but it's the, um, only naturally occurring disease that humans have eliminated, uh, various reasons for that and so on that, uh, we'll get into, but, uh, anyway, so it's usually seen as like the triumph of modern medicine, you know, we, we, we conquered smallpox. Um, anyway, so we'll talk about all these things, starting with the facts of the disease. What, what is smallpox? Uh, it's a virus, the variola virus, many subtypes and so on. Uh, variola major though is the, is the main one. Um, and uh, why is it called smallpox? Well, I'll show you a picture in just a minute. Of, I can show you now, I guess, of the pox. You know, these uh, um, sores you get on your uh, skin. Um, it's, uh, it's called smallpox, though, to distinguish it from another disease, which was called the great pox. And because you have bigger sores on your skin. And we'll talk about that disease next week. All right. So this week, then, the smallpox. Uh, treatment, none, okay? Um, contagious transmission, person-to-person -person transmission. Uh, one of the reasons why, you know, it's, uh, it was, we were able to eliminate it, actually, was because there's no animal reservoir or animal role in transmission as there was with, with obviously, with, uh, you know, bubonic plague and so on. Um, uh, you, uh, so it's person-to-person -person transmission or from what are known as fomites. Fomites are items, uh, physical items that can transmit infection, you know, like, um, you know, clothing. So if you get the secretions from uh, the pox um, on, on clothing, blankets and stuff like that, you can transmit it to, some, to another person. You know, one of the videos you're going to watch today um, talks about doing that uh, in a germ warfare kind of way. Um, anyway, by the way, it is pronounced fomites. Uh, I had a friend who worked in a hospital, and she said they pronounced it fomites. It's like she said, everyone just calls it fomites, but it's okay. Don't be that person. Uh, it's fomites anyway. All right, uh, pedantic rant over. Let's move along. Medical facts: incubation period, average length ten to fourteen days. Generally not contagious during the incubation period, but only when you start uh, expressing symptoms, which are going to be high fever, vomiting, muscle aches, which are the symptoms of almost everything. Right? Okay. Then the rash sets in, and that's what's distinctive. The rash starting in the tongue and the mouth, spreads to the arms and the legs. By day eight, the rashes um, develop into sores, which are filled with fluid, and it's that fluid which is the most contagious then. Uh, and then they become raised pustules. They crust and scab over. We'll talk about scabs at the end of the lecture here. And they're still contagious. And the scabs fall off, leaving your skin, assuming you survive, leaving your skin uh, damaged. So it lasts about four weeks altogether. Uh, and then after the scabs are gone, no longer contagious. And you have lifetime immunity. That's a key point. Once again, it's going to allow for um, uh, eventually for uh, vaccination and eradication. So showed you the picture already. Um, uh, kind of interesting. I don't think I want to um, rely on this entirely, but you have a, what's known as differential diagnosis, okay? Uh, where a, a medical personnel comes in and says, oh, it could be this or it could be this, right? Uh, how do you know? Well, you got crusty scabs, smallpox, typically 
once again, starts in the, in the mouth and nose and then spreads to the extremities, okay? Whereas chicken pox generally um, focuses on the torso. All right, so if you're, <laughs> if you're stuck in the bush and you need to know the difference, there you go. All right, okay, immunity to mortality. So immunity, surviving an infection gives lifetime immunity, we think, okay, <laughs> mortality. Ordinarily, about 30% mortality in ordinary smallpox due to organ failure between days 10 and 16. As you know from reading Watts, he talks about about a 90% mortality rate <clears throat> if you have a population um, uh, that, that uh, <clears throat> has never encountered it before. So somewhere between 75 and 90% in what's what's typically referred to as a, a virgin population, a population that has not been exposed to this disease before. Other complications, blindness, respiratory infections, secondary skin infections, scarring of the skin, especially the face and so on. So nasty disease, not one you want, right? Okay, now, one other thing I gotta say <clears throat> that, uh, that Watts says in the first paragraph here, um, you know, he talks about uh, the absence of smallpox in the New World. Um, he says, however, any statement which goes beyond this is likely to be contested. And I'm going to contest some of it today, all right? Because I, I think he and some of the other literature is wrong about things. By the way, I do want to say, um, if, you want to read, if you want to know more about smallpox and have a really good read, I recommend this book. This is by Elizabeth Fenn, F-E-N-N. Pox Americana, the great smallpox epidemic of 1775-82, and this is in British North America, so it's happening during the same time as the American Revolution, and one of the things she shows is the impact it had on the revolution. So it's a, it's a very good book. Uh, however, there's a very bad quote on the back, i got to say, <laughs> a chilling portrait of the first contact between the New World and the virus. Well, that's not true. Okay, we know there was a, the, the virus hit the New World in 1518. So I don't know what the hell this person's talking about. But anyway, that's just a quote. That's just a quote on the back. The rest of the book is is quite good. It's in a very good um, uh, medical history, and it's uh, and it's a it's a good uh, read. Um, so smallpox. You want a good reading on smallpox? I recommend that book. All right, let's move along here. History of smallpox. First evidence of smallpox we have. Um, is from this mummy, Ramses V, 1145 BC. And you can see on the skin there, once again, I hope you're not looking at this on your phone, but uh, um, you know, blow it up on a larger screen, and you can see the, the, the pox on his, uh, on his skin there, on the face. Um, so I don't know if they, if they uh, did a DNA analysis on that to see what, what kind anyway, but it's, but it's certainly physical archeological evidence of, of smallpox there. Um, the first documented description was in China in about the fourth century AD. There's absolutely no mention of anything identifiable as smallpox in the Bible or in Greek, Greek and Roman writings. Um, so anyway, nothing, nothing from the ancients about this. It becomes established in Europe by the fifth or sixth century AD. So probably developed, uh, in, in China, somewhere in Asia, and then of course spread as it does. Um, there's various outbreaks here, 18th century Europe, the smallpox kills about 400,000 people a year. Um, as I said, nasty disease, not one you want. The, what we're looking at here and what Watts focuses on really is, um, What's the impact on the Americas? Um, so let's take a look at, as I said, this issue of historical demography. What was the impact of smallpox? Here's what Watts says on page 88. He says, Hispaniola in 1492, at least a million people and perhaps five to six million people equivalent to combined population of British Isles and Scandinavia. Okay, this is just Hispaniola. What is Hispaniola? That is what is today the island in the Caribbean which is half of it's Haiti, the other half is the Dominican Republic, all right? And that's where, um, uh, if you don't know, Columbus landed on, I think his first voyage, if one of his, and certainly his first, you know, Columbus went, what, three times? Three voyages, I think? Anyway, um, so, um, so, anyway, Watts, back, back to Watts here, populations, Watts, uh, Watts says Mexico slash Mesoamerica, on page 90, he says this, in 1518, uh, over 25 million. 
and by 1605 reduced to 1.1 million. All right. Uh, okay. Now, um, spread in the Americas. All I, want, what I want you to do is pause the video right here of me, okay, and watch this other one from minute 840 onward because it's going to talk about spread of smallpox to the Americas and the impact it has. All right. I'll drink water. You go watch that video. Welcome back. Okay, you're back again. So you you watched that video about the spread in the Americas and the impact and so on, right? Okay. One of the things about Watts and that video is they talk a lot about numbers, population numbers, right? And that's important, obviously, because if we don't know what the population was, we can't really make comments about the impact of the disease, right? Okay. Well, anytime somebody starts talking about numbers, you you, you know, you've got to get precise. And you need to know, first off, where are these numbers coming from? And secondly, you need to know how are they being created, right? Just as, you know, historical methodology here. Okay, almost all population estimates of the Americas are based on the work of two individuals, Sherburne Cook and Woodrow Bora, Cook and Bora, all right? They pioneered historical demography in the Americas, and in particular, estimates of the pre-contact, pre-Columbian population in the Americas. Why? Because it's widely accepted that after contact, in some cases within a couple decades, widespread changes were ushered in, and none of those changes were good for the native population. All right? It was all but wiped out in many areas. And this is all part of what's known as the, the Columbian Exchange. Okay, After Columbus, the exchange of, well, everything across the Atlantic, right? ideas, religion, culture, plants, okay, obviously foodstuffs from the Americas to Europe, Africa, etc., but also diseases, all right, including, of course, smallpox, all right. Now, the question is, if we're going to pinpoint the historical impact of smallpox, we first need to know the pre-Columbian population, okay. Well, starting in the, in the, from the 1950s and 1960s, scholarly estimates of, I'm going to focus here on, on the island of Hispaniola. Scholarly estimates were between 60,000 and 600,000 native inhabitants. Now, that's a factor of 10, so obviously that's not very precise, right? But okay, so somewhere in that range. Okay? Cook and Bora come along, though, and change that entirely. What are their estimates? Their estimates are in 1492, so essentially pre-contact or right on the cusp of contact, about 8 million native inhabitants. By 1496, only four years later, they estimate 4 million native inhabitants. By 1514, 30,000. By the mid-16th century, none. So, according to Cook and Bora, on the island of Hispaniola, we go from 8 million inhabitants to none in, well, about 50 years. So, as I said, you need to know where are these numbers coming from. Okay, well, what's their methodology? Well, the figures for 1514 in the mid 16th century are considered pretty valid because there were uh, Spanish there who were doing census. Um, well, they you know they wanted to know how many inhabitants were there so they could they could know a number of workers. Frankly, um, so the earlier figures though Cook and Bora did they arrived at by logarithmic projection backwards and a series of other assumptions based on early sources, including the reports of Columbus in the journal of his first voyage, figures from Bartolomé de las Casas. I don't know if you know Bartolomé de las Casas. He wrote a famous tract about, uh, about the native inhabitants of the Americas and uh, basically how they should be uh, protected, um, and evidence of a repartimiento of Indians in or about 1496. What's a repartimiento? Repartimiento. There we go. Okay. It was basically forced labor. All right. So once again, of course, the Spanish colonizers, this is what they do. They come in, take over an area, and they want to start profiting from it. But in order to do that, of course, you need labor. Um, all right. So there's some problems here, though. And you saw this coming, I'm sure. <laughs> some problems with what Cook and Bora are doing and what they are basing their assumptions on. First is with Columbus's journal, okay? And it's 
we don't have the originals. There's a surviving secondhand version. It offers comments both about a dense population and a sparse population. Okay, so he shows up in 1492 and says both. Oh, a lot of people here, not many people here. Okay, what did Cook and Bora do? Well, they, they go with the lot of people here comment and they ignore the other one and don't explain why. Okay, so that's problem number one. Secondly, Columbus, not really that good <laughs> of an observer. Uh, he's just not. So, starting with the size of the island of Hispaniola, and the population of Hispaniola, and comments he made about the population of Cuba. Right? Um, so, anyway, so the second source that they rely on is Bartolome de las Casas. I told you what he's famous for then. He produced a number of population estimates over the years, including 1516 to 1535. He estimated about 1.1 million people on Hispaniola. And from 1542 to 1552, he estimated 3 million people. Okay, so the number's going up there. It's supposed to be going down, right? Because by the middle of the of the 16th century, we're, we're ended up with zero. So, um, but he does not explain why he changed his numbers uh, and what that was based on. Um, so, obviously, not a great not a great source then for uh, for basing other work on. Okay, we have a number of other estimates of the population, mostly. Um, from the period of time when, as once again, the Spanish were, were well established on the island. And this is, of course, Hispaniola here. There's an anonymous source from 1516 that says about a million souls on the island. Uh, Dominicans, 1519, estimated 1.1 million persons. Uh, Bernardo de Santo Domingo, 1517, says 1.1 million vecinos. Uh, and Alonso de Zuvazo, says 1.13 million Indians on the entire island, okay? So, we're looking somewhere, and, you know, estimates then obviously are, are, well, we don't know how good they are, but at least they're consistent, right? Okay. So, what do Cook and Board do with these numbers? First, they conclude, <laughs> these figures are much too low, right? <laughs> Based on what? Well, I, we don't know, okay? They just said, that seems low to us. So, what do they do? All right, so the first thing they did is they assumed those numbers only refer to an adult population. Well, maybe there's some validity there because these numbers were mostly census figures, once again, because the Spanish were interested in labor, right? So they're, they're looking at labor, okay? Maybe so. But secondly, they assumed that since only about half the island was under Spanish control, these numbers should be doubled to account for the entire island, even though the people at the time said this is the entire island, okay? Third, they assumed the adult population was 60% of the total, leading them to conclude the real population of Hispaniola was 3.7 million people in 1496. All right. Um, okay, so as you can see here, there's a rash of assumptions here, any one of which, you know, may not be legitimate. Right? Um, okay, and the final step. So having arrived at a figure of 3.7 million in 1496, they next need to use that to infer the size of the population of 1492, a population they estimated about 8 million, okay? Based on what again? Well, okay, take a step back here. So they say 8 million people in 1492 and close to, close to 4 million in 1496. That's four years apart, okay? That means nearly 1 million people had to die every year from 1496 from 1492 to 1496 and not one person on the island wrote about it actually no comment whatsoever about this massive die-off like really a million people a year on this island i mean there are going to be heaps of bodies everywhere right i mean think about like the rwanda genocide that's what we're talking about every year for four or five years Bodies piled up everywhere, and nobody mentions it, okay? And then what did they die of, okay? Was it smallpox? Because that's what, you know, people talk mostly about, right? Okay, well, smallpox wasn't introduced in Hispaniola until 1518, 1519. Once again, smallpox is a pretty distinctive disease. Europeans recognized it from, what, the 5th, 6th century onward, okay? And you know, at least knew what it was, okay? So, 
and nobody's nobody mentions it until 15, 18, 15, 19. So it's really, first off, it's implausible that many people are dying off. Secondly, it's virtually impossible that, that, that smallpox is what's, what's going to be doing the killing here. Okay, so what killed the Tayano, the native inhabitants of, of Hispaniola? Okay, option one. Eight million Tayano were reduced to four million in four years, and then in almost nothing in another 50 years due to epidemic disease. That's the story that's normally told here, right? Okay, or... Option two, there were at most 500,000 Tayano in 1492. They were reduced to 30,000 by 1514 by a combination of viral disease, probably brought by Spanish livestock. As we know from COVID, swine flu, whatever, you know, animals are a distinct reservoir for a number of diseases that can impact humans, right? Okay, so combination of viral disease, starvation, and the effects of slave labor by the centralization and labor regimes of Spanish colonizers. Okay, as you probably guessed at this point, I think option two is, is where the smart money goes. Okay, so option one and some of the you know, comments in, in, in Watts and, and videos and so on is just way out of line. There's just no evidence to support that. All right, okay. All right, so let's move on. So that's my historical demography rant. Let's talk about immunizations and vaccinations. Why? Because smallpox is going to be one of the first diseases where we see these developing and one of the greatest impacts that we're going to have with, of course, ultimately eradication. All right, so let's start by defining your terms here. Immunization. And before I get started, if you want to pause and go take a break, this is, this is a good time to do it. Um, okay, are you back? I'm still here. Uh, immunization, a process by which a person becomes protected against a disease through vaccination. Um, vaccination, the act of introducing a vaccine into the body to produce immunity to a specific disease. As we know from COVID and, and everything else, these terms tend to be used interchangeably. Um, or sometimes not precisely, especially if you're a douchebag like Aaron Rodgers, who says, oh yeah, I'm immunized, when of course he was not vaccinated, right? But he wanted to, to, to you know, he wanted people to assume he was vaccinated, uh, but he wasn't, because he's, he's an idiot anyway. Okay, so yeah, yeah, I'm a Bears fan, so what? Okay, um, so immunization, vaccinations, um, somewhat interchangeable, but specifically vaccination, of course, is using a vaccine to produce an immune response in the body. Okay, um, this is was done in various places in the world. Watts talks about this, talks about Turkey and so on. Uh, what I want you to do is pause me again and watch this video about fighting smallpox in colonial America because I think it's quite fascinating. Um, once again, get my my uh, um, uh, push in here for Elizabeth Fenn's book, also about obviously colonial America and so on. So watch that video and then come back and, and see me in a few minutes here. Are you back? Oh, I assumed you're back. Okay, let's keep going then, all right? So, what do we do before we had vaccines? Well, there was a process uh, called serum immunity. And there's also actually, I got another book here I, I recommend um, that discusses this. It's called The Great, Flu Great, uh, the Great Influenza uh, by John Barry. Who's not a historian? He's more of a journalist, I think. But um, but it's a good read. A lot of good stories here about the Spanish flu pandemic. You know, 1918, 1919, millions of people died around the world. Um, he talks about serum immunity in here uh, because that's that's all we had at the time. Uh, so what you do is you take an animal. In the in, in the case of influenza, it was horses, um, and infect them with it, and their bodies produce uh, antibodies. Okay, uh, and then you take the blood out, uh, centrifuge it, take out the antibodies, and use them to treat people and to give a what's known as a, a temporary or passive immunity against the disease. Um, so that you know, using an anti serum is was a, a type of uh, well, not really treatment, a preventative of before vaccinations were developed for things. Um, 
then there was, as you saw in the video, what's known as variolization. Variolation. Variolation. <laughs> Get that down. Um, um, you know, and it's named because of smallpox, the variola virus. Uh, that's where the name came from. You know, it's it's uh, using a um, a little bit either either a related disease like cowpox or a little bit of the serum from a, a, a you know a, a non-fatal case uh, to give somebody immunity to the disease. Uh, from that, then it goes direct direct line to the development of vaccination. Okay, and we have a number of vaccines available today. Of course, um, three basic types. I actually uh, these are the these are the classic two. Is the one is the attenuated, which means a weakened form, um, but it uses a live microbe. So measles, mumps, rubella. Smallpox, chickenpox, yellow fever, all uh, had been examples of those. Um, there are also inactivated vaccines where they use the killed microbe, but your body still produces an immune response to it. Hepatitis A, influenza, rabies would be examples of those. There's a third type, of we, as we know now, uh, recently developed for, from COVID, is uh, messenger RNA or mRNA, where they just use a portion of the uh, well, the messenger RNA from the microbe. So you don't even have to have a, um, a real microbe um, on there, which is which is good because, of course, you know, sometimes when you have these live vaccines, um, bad things happen. You get the disease, for example, and diseases can break out from, from vaccination back in the day. Uh, so I got to say, you know, messenger RNA is, is, a, is a great way to go. And of course, we have a lot of vaccines available today. You know, the CDC recommendations uh, just from birth to 15 months are 18 total vaccinations. And I remember taking my kids in for these. I hated them. But, yeah. but you know what? Mm, I also hate meningitis and <laughs> polio. So I got to say, recently, if you were reading about the polio outbreak in New York State, because people aren't vaccinating their kids. Oh, God. Anyway, people. Um, so we got 18 here, seven bacterial um, but viruses are, have always been a, um, a particular target of developing, for developing uh, vaccines because, of course, viral diseases, uh, we don't have, uh, typically don't have cures. We have some antiviral treatments nowadays, but we don't have, they're not, you can't cure them necessarily the same way you can bacterial diseases by antibiotics. Um, so viral diseases were certainly a, um, a, a target um, but bacterial diseases also because, you know, ounce of prevention, prevention is, of course, better than, uh, than having somebody get the disease. Anyway, so how vaccines eradicated, eradicated common diseases. You can see a number of these, and these are uh, numbers um, from the United States uh, before and after um, vaccines were uh, introduced for these various diseases. So looking at the top at measles. Um, the annual morbidity, which means the number of cases, was over 500,000, right? Um, when we had widespread measles vaccination, um, then reported cases in 2019 was almost 1,300. So we went from 500,000 to 1,300. Pertussis, uh, from about 200,000 a year to 15,000. Why? Well, because people aren't vaccinating, you know, as, as much as they should. Mumps. Um, also, also incredible uh, reduction, um, rubella, smallpox, of course, zero, diphtheria, two cases a year, polio, zero cases in 2019. Unfortunately, this last year, that wasn't, it's not the case. There's been dozens, as I said, in New York State. Um, anyway, all of which shows vaccines can be very effective. And you see that here with the measles vaccine. You see this um, Number of cases on the left-hand side there. You see when the vaccine was introduced and when it become became widespread by about 1970, and the cases just plummeted. Um, we see here, well, from over 500,000 to about 1,200. Um, so obviously, vaccination can be extremely um, uh, effective in preventing disease, um, and that's what's going to lead then to the eradication of smallpox. And so. Pause me again, watch this short video, which will tra trace you through the uh, eradication of smallpox, okay? Welcome back. 
Great news, right? Smallpox is eradicated. Yay! All right. Or is it? <laughs> Watts says, now once again, Watts is published in, what is this, 98, 99? Okay. So he says, the World Health Organization decided in 1996 the remaining stocks of smallpox virus held by the U.S. and the Soviets slash Russia would be destroyed in 1999. But was it? Well, we, we're not really sure. But also, uh, that, okay, that really didn't happen. And it still hasn't happened. Um, and furthermore, there have been some news stories showing uh, uh, smallpox found in various places. Okay, here's, and I'll put these uh, links on, uh, on the agenda. Um, this is 2003. Um, there's a university library in New Mexico where they found an old um, medical book. And inside the book was an envelope. And inside that envelope were smallpox scabs that somebody had removed, some doctor had removed from patients, put in an envelope, put it in the book, and then the book ends up in the library. So we got smallpox sitting there, right? Okay, not, not great. Okay? But, you know, then 2014, what happens? Uh, the National Institutes of Health are cleaning out a storeroom, and what they find? They find six vials labeled as variola, smallpox virus, okay? Um, six forgotten vials in a lab, which for some reason was being used by the Food and Drug Administration, okay? Um, so, and nobody knew these vials were there, and there's at least two of them, um, the virus was still alive. Okay, so that's at least from the 1970s to 2014. Um, and so then that was shipped down to the CDC. So, <laughs> uh, is, uh, is smallpox eliminated? Uh, well, we're not really sure, okay? Uh, still finding it uh, around in places. So, and presumably then, you know, the CDC was still keeping it alive. The argument was they were afraid of some of somebody else, you know, getting a hold of it someplace else and using it for germ warfare. Because if we're not vaccinated against it anymore, it would be a very effective uh, um, germ warfare agent. So their argument was they wanted to keep some around so they could produce vaccine if we need it. Right. Well, knowing what I know of humans and especially the last few years, um, I wouldn't put it past somebody. OK. Yeah. Putin, I'm looking at you. All right. Okay, that's what I wanted to get through today. Um, uh, you had the supplementary videos also, so I hope you found that uh, informative. Thanks very much. See you next week.